Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled Alabama in World War II. These are the general topics we'll cover. An overview, military mobilization, industrial mobilization, civilian mobilization, and finally, a little bit about war and society in Alabama. In his book entitled Fourth to the Mighty Conflict, from whence so much of this lecture comes, Professor Alan Cronenberg wrote that World War II played, quote, a leading role in shaping the state, unquote. It led to, quote, more equality of opportunity, unquote, for racial and gender relations, and, quote, explosive expansion of industry, unquote, that increased long-term urbanization and ramped up education. The war led to significant changes in agriculture, Particularly, it finished off sharecropping as the leading edge of farming in the state, except for some areas of the Black Belt, and led to greater farm mechanization. Finally, the war stabilized and modernized the state's economy, mostly by providing significant surpluses in tax revenues that Governor Dixon and Sparks made good use of, and that implies that, that there was a lot more wage money in the system, which indeed there was. I'll follow a similar path through these topics that I've just laid out as I did in discussing World War I. Let's look at military mobilization first. In World War I, the state's signature contribution to the Army was the 167th Regiment of the 42nd Infantry Division. In World War II, that signature contribution was 4,000 National Guardsmen who entered the 31st Infantry Division in 1940. The 31st, also called the Dixie Division, was led by General John Persons, a banker from Birmingham who had been associated with the Alabama National Guard. Like Colonel William Screws in World War I's 167th Regiment, Persons was one of the few National Guard commanders who had the privilege of leading his troops throughout the entire war. The 31st trained in Florida and South Carolina, spent a good deal of time as a training division, then performed bravely and well in the Pacific Theater of Operations. Okay, let's talk about selective service or the draft. By the summer of 1941, even before the U.S. entered the war in December, the draft drew in 350,000 Alabama registrants. And to cap this off, about 300,000 Alabamians served in uniform. More than 6,000 died, and 12 won the Congressional Medal of Honor. Because Alabama's climate was conducive to year-round training, because labor was un unusually inexpensive, and because the Alabama congressional delegation was so strong, the War Department cited a number of large uh, army bases, air court fields, and POW camps in the state. All of these brought jobs, money, and new life into Alabama that was, at the time, integrating into the rest of the nation as it recovered from the Great Depression. Near Anniston, at the site of Camp McClellan from World War I, was what came to be Fort McClellan. The Army had let it deteriorate, so they invested $6 million in improvements and turned it into a training and induction center. Eventually, it became a replacement training camp and added advanced combat training. The old 92nd Infantry Division now composed of 6,500 African-American troops, was reconstituted at Camp Fort McClellan. Camp Rucker in Dale County near Ozark emerged from the old New Deal Resettled Administration's attempt to build what they called Bear Farm. In 1940, this camp opened as the 60,000-acre Ozark Triangular Division Camp and was named for Camp Rucker in 1942. 30,000 troops trained in 17-week cycles, and the camp produced the 81st, 35th, 66th, and 98th Infantry Divisions. 
1944, it converted to a replacement troop training center like Camp McClellan. Another camp near Gadsden, Camp Seibert, opened in 1944 at a cost of $18 million. It was large enough to train in all aspects of warfare, including chemical warfare and aerial missions. But the war ended 18 months later, and Seibert was decommissioned as rapidly as it was erected. The Army also ran POW camps in the state. The two largest were the camps at Aliceville in West Alabama and Opelika in East Alabama. These camps housed German and Italian troops captured beginning with the North African campaign and then later other campaigns. Hardcore Nazis were separated from these troops and they were interred in Oklahoma. Prisoners worked in the camps and they worked for local farmers. Other camps, like Camp Rucker, had POWs at their main camp and they even had branch POW camps. There were few escape attempts, but being so far from home made escape unmotivating for most of the prisoners. The Army Air Corps established multiple fields in Alabama, which according to Cronenberg, made Alabama third after Texas and California in the number of airmen it trained. This was mostly because Maxwell Field, which had been commissioned in 1922 from World War I's old Repair Depot Number no. 3 in Montgomery, was home to the Southeast Air Corps Training Center. Also in 1940, General Hap Arnold proposed that pilots from Great Britain and France train in the United States rather than risk being shot down by German pilots in their own countries. This was called the Arnold Plan, and it commissioned multiple bases, many in Alabama, to train U.S. and for foreign uh, pilots, mostly RAF, in basic, intermediate, and advanced single-engine and multi-engine combat flying. Maxwell in Montgomery and its sister field in Montgomery, Gunter, had some of these cadets along with women Army Corps black trainees, and then later they did B-24 training. Craig Field in Selma had a stable force of 2,000 soldiers and 1,400 civilians to train hundreds of cadets in advanced single-engine flight, as did Napier Field near Dothan. Both fields were purpose-built, and they were purpose-built rapidly in 1940 and 41. Cortland Airfield in the Tennessee Valley was a principal basic flight school, and Moton Field was home to the African-American pilots known as the Tuskegee Airmen. In 34 classes, over 1,000 black pilots learned single-engine flying, then, in 1943, twin-engine bomber flying. Moton was home to the 99th Pursuit Squadron, the famous Red Tails, the 332nd Fighter Group, and the 447th Composite Group of Bombers that did not deploy because the war ended. Moton Field was deactivated in 1946. The Army established two technical service command fields, one in Birmingham, the other more important one just south of Mobile in Brookley Field. Brookley was a supply depot and bomber modification site that worked on B-24s and B-29s. Brookley became the largest employer of women in Alabama in 1943, as well as a major center for vocational training, including handicapped workers. Alabama's industries either expanded or grew from scratch to supply war material beginning in 1940. As Alan Cronenberg wrote, Almost 60% of the federal funds expended in Alabama during the war were directly related to munitions manufacturing. Federal installations and private concerns, sometimes working in tandem, created exceptional opportunities for rural workers to trade in their plows for wrenches, riveters, and welders. Ordnance plants made the components of artillery and small arms ammunition. Alabama ordnance plants focused on artillery as well as components required for things like airplanes and ships. 
ordinance was concentrated in the region we call North Alabama. Slightly to the east of dead center North Alabama, Northeast Alabama, the Gadsden Ordnance Plant and Lounsdale Steel and Iron forged and machined artillery shells, and the nearby Anison Ordnance Depot stored ammunition and repaired both artillery and vehicles. In 1943, the Chrysler Corporation assumed management of the Anison, Anison Ordnance Depot and its workforce of 7,700 civilians. Birmingham was the primary ordnance site. There, O'Neill Steel Company made general purpose bombs. Stockham fitting and valves made 4.5 million 75 millimeter shells, as well as millions of grenades. TCI, a subsidiary of US Steel, made 5 million 155 millimeter artil artillery shells and Connors Steel made two million bomb casings. Stockham Valve and Fittings also made fittings for ships produced in the Mobile shipyards. Huntsville had two arsenals and an ordnance depot. Between the Huntsville Arsenal and the Redstone Ordnance Plant, Huntsville produced poison gas, phosgene, that was never deployed, but it also produced millions of smoke pots and smoke bombs. Cronenberg reports that almost all of the 2 million smoke pots deployed in U.S. amphibious landings in Europe and in the Pacific were made at these Huntsville plants. We see much the same story in private, industrial, and agricultural expansion to produce war goods and agricultural products to feed and clothe the war effort. Crops expanded beyond cotton into corn, legumes, and cattle. Mechanization, that is tractors, made leaps in replacing scarce farm labor and farms consolidated while growing larger. Of particular note were the DuPont Chemical Corporation facilities, the Alabama Ordnance Works in Childersburg and the Coosa River Ordnance Plant in Talladega. Both of these were close to each other and close to Birmingham. Together, they cost $90 million and employed 25,000 workers to construct, and then they employed 14,000 workers to make powder, TNT, and secretly heavy water for the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, making the atomic bomb. These plants faded quickly after the war when the market for high explosives, oddly enough, suddenly imploded. Alabama had two aircraft repair and modification facilities, one in Birmingham, like I've said, and the other at Berkeley Field and Mobile. They repaired mostly B-29 bombers and did serious modifications on the B-29 before bomb crews were willing to trust the new airplane. In Mobile II were two great shipbuilding companies, ADSCO and the Gulf Shipbuilding Company of Chickasaw. ADSCO had contracts for 20 Liberty transport ships. It built 102 oil tankers, and it repaired 2,800 vessels in dry dock. Gulf shipbuilders built seven destroyers, 29 mine sweepers, 30 oil tankers, and many other smaller vessels. As they did in World War I, Alabama civilians mobilized for the war effort. Alabamians organized formally and informally in state and national groups, as well as in ad hoc community groups and, and events. Some of these had long lasting effects, un unlike their World War I counterparts. One was the Alabama State Defense Council that produced, among other things, the long running civil defense network. Considered the best state program in the Southeast and the second best in the nation, the Alabama State Defense Council trained 80,000 Alabamians, including 23,000 women, to be air raid wardens, Red Cross volunteers, and among other things, auxiliaries to what we call first responders today. An innovation that was not conceivable in World War I, the Civil Air Patrol was an arm of civil defense and continues to exist today as a civilian auxiliary to the Air Force. <laughs> 
It got its start in 1936, but solidified in 1941 as a joint project of the Departments of Commerce, Navy, and War. In Alabama, the Civil Air Patrol, CAP, trained pilots to patrol mostly the Gulf Coast as German U-boats uh, infiltrated there to attack shipping. Alabama's chapters of the Red Cross assembled comfort kits early in the war for British civilians, conducted blood drives, sold war bonds, and rolled bandages. Its Birmingham chapter made a production line at the public library where they rolled four million bandages. Ad hoc organizations included the Motor Corps that stood ready to supplement ground transportation for military purposes as needed, and the Nurses Aid Corps that took over many unskilled duties in hospitals that had usually fallen to nurses. This relieved nurses of those unskilled duties so that fewer nurses were needed and could focus on skilled care. When fewer nurses were needed, those nurses could then enlist or really had already enlisted. Probably the most well-known civilian service organization was the USO, the United Services Organization. By May 1942, the USO operated in 19 Alabama towns, replacing locally operated servicemen's clubs and making a centralized program out of locally managed and informal community entertainments for soldiers and there were white and black USOs. The state government under Governor Sparks created a relief organization called the Alabama War Chest to help local people and agencies through temporary setbacks or cash flow problems. This was funded through contributions and through state appropriations. Civilians also did all kinds of drives with which anyone who's ever watched World War II movies is familiar. Metal, rubber, fats, and oils were all commodities in short supply, and gathering formerly wasted materials went far in both boosting morale and providing more materiel for the battlefront. Another body of drives were the seven war bond drives. Alabama counties always reached their quota, and many exceeded it in every drive. Another thing we're all familiar with is rationing. Not everything that was rationed was rationed all at once. And rationing itself was a nationally driven program that required customers to pay for goods both in money and with ration stamps from ration books. It didn't matter how much money you had. If you didn't have ration stamps, you either couldn't get the goods or you had to go to the criminal black market to get them. Tires were rationed first, then gasoline, which was rationed in an effort to reduce car travel and thus the need for tires, then sugar, coffee, which was rationed only for a short time, and meat. Sugar and meat were either rationed or had their prices controlled until 1946. Alabama had two governors during the war and in its run-up. Both were conservatives who were allied with the Big Mule Black Belt Coalition, and both were staunch segregationists who feared federal intervention into white supremacy and anti-unionism, which then and later was called the Southern way of life. Frank Dixon, the first of these governors, was from the Virginia Tidewater. He was a lawyer who lost a leg as an aviator in World War I, but he had a bent toward modernization and effective administration. He tightened the inefficient, loose organization of state bureaus, consolidated many, and centralized power in the governor's hands more so than any governor before him. He created the teacher's retirement system in Alabama during his first year in office and created the merit system for state employment after demanding the dismissal of every state employee hired after the 1938 election. That is, his predecessor had flooded the state with spoilsmen and with what you might call plants. And Dixon ran all those people out because they may or may not have been qualified. And then the jobs that had to be refilled, he set up a merit system to do that. 
His successor, Chauncey Sparks, was a lawyer from Eufaula who most people thought would batten down the lid of the Treasury like turn-of-the-century governors had done. He inherited a Treasury surplus and applied it in ways that some historians consider turned him into, ironically, a progressive. I'll repeat this later, but he rejected calls to lower or refund property taxes. Then he doubled the state appropriation to education, added a month to the school year, reestablished the State Department of Labor, and reduced Alabama's bonded indebtedness by 25%. Under Sparks, Alabamians passed a constitutional amendment to let the legislature meet every two years instead of every four years, which made state operations much more responsive to changing conditions. Both Dixon and Sparks were more motivated more by questions of race than by questions of labor. When the Supreme Court ruled against all white primaries in the case Smith v. Allwright in 1944, Spark supported the Boswell Amendment that added the infamous understanding test to the bevy of voter for disfranchisement laws in Alabama. But he balked at joining the Dixiecrat bolt from the Democratic Party in 1948. Dixon, on the other hand, had been considered a prime candidate for the Dixiecrat nomination for president in 1948. He deferred in favor of Strom Thurmond of South Carolina, who served in the U.S. Senate until he was 101 years old. But Dixon gave the keynote address at the founding Dixiecrat convention in Birmingham in 1948. Let's look at some examples, that is, things to think about, really, and how the war affected Alabama society. Ramping up for what appeared to be an inevitable entry into World War II meant that federal and private money came into Alabama to build war industries early on. A quick metric to judge just how much money came into the state is wage payments. These rose between 1939 and 1946 from $239 million to $708 million dollars. That is wages being paid in the state, almost tripled in nominal uh, amounts. It's a, a huge amount of money flowing into the state, being spent by people in the state who didn't really have that much to spend it on. Once war began, Men enlisted and were drafted in such numbers that it was difficult to staff jobs, and with the rise in war industries, people migrated either to Alabama cities or to the north and the west. According to Cronenberg, about, quote, about 10% of whites and about 25% of blacks moved into towns or out of state. Urban population grew by 57%. By the end of World War II, industrial and commercial jobs remained 46% higher than before the war, unquote. Mobile gained 89,000 immigrants, for example. This depopulated the countryside, which gave incentive to landowners to incorporate machinery, that is tractors, to replace missing sharecroppers and agricultural workers. Migration put a strain on city infrastructure, just like it had in World War I, but for longer periods and with greater intensity. Housing was a serious problem. Rent skyrocketed, and some places like Mobile saw the return to the so-called hotbed system in which someone would rent a bed for an eight-hour sleeping shift. The bed was never unoccupied. In Mobile, the Federal Housing Authority built 11,000 housing units, but they were all reserved for white workers and families and never really alleviated the housing problem. War shortages prevented states and counties from widening and paving roads, so transportation suffered. I'll give you an example. The Childersburg Munition Plant, for example, drew workers mostly from Birmingham who could not move to the tiny town. The town went from 500 to 17,000 people, and its infrastructure never caught up. So people lived in Birmingham, and they drove over, but the state couldn't pave the road. And so it was 16 or 20 miles of dirt road, which meant that traffic could be tied up for hours, especially in bad weather. 
schools, especially urban schools, could not keep up with rapid demands placed on them by newly arriving working families. So overcrowding was common, and some school systems went to shifts in their studies. Finally, medical care suffered. Facilities could not be expanded quickly enough, and they could not be staffed with medical personnel who otherwise were entering the military anyway. So people did without, frequently to their detriment. On the other hand, many Alabamians didn't visit doctors regularly anyway, so this might not have been a problem for them, but public health did suffer as cities got crowded. During World War II, Full state coffers combined with Governor Sparks' resistance to refunding taxes and the wartime shortages that made building infrastructure almost impossible led to Alabama's doubling state appropriations for schools and lengthening the term from seven to eight months. Unfortunately, migration into cities overburdened those school districts and buildings, and even with new operational funds, other shortages left schools overwhelmed with students. You can have a lot of money, but if you can't buy the bricks, you can't buy the chairs, you can't hire the teachers because they don't exist, that money either sits or it goes into paying reasonable salaries for teachers. Higher education suffered from twin problems, a whipsaw effect, you might say. Military enlistments and easily available work drove enrollment numbers down. At the University of Alabama, the student body fell from 5,000 in 1941 to 1,850 by 1944. At API, uh, that is Auburn, enrollments fell likewise. And because we're here at Troy, by 1944, Troy had 197 students. Nevertheless, Bama and API recovered somewhat by training civilian and military personnel. The students in intensive programs on campus and at satellite centers participated in what came to be called Engineering Science and Management War Training, ESMWT. Civilians filled the needs of industries and commerce, and military trainees entered engineering and communication-related units throughout all of the services and in the war zones. API, Alabama Polytechnic Institute, Auburn, trained 32,000 of these so-called 90-day wonders during the war, and Bama trained 13,000. But the real jolt to higher education in Alabama was the so-called GI Bill of Rights, passed in 1944, the GI Bill. It offered tuition, housing, and business benefits to millions of World War II veterans, though it was almost impossible for African-American veterans to get their benefits. These were administered locally, and so a lot of times when African-Americans went to apply for benefits, they might be steered in the wrong direction or steered to unskilled jobs. When they refused to take those unskilled jobs, then they were not given uh, the appropriate uh, unemployment benefits. They also received less in tuition uh, subsistence uh, payments. They received less in business operational payments. They received less in uh, housing payments, and those were harder to access for them. People just said no. Uh, the, the, the people who were supplying these things uh, at the local level just would not do so to African Americans. Thus, white colleges were flooded with students and vocational programs ramped up. An example of this is that between 1946, when veterans really started returning home, and 1950, 10,000 veterans had enrolled in Alabama Polytechnic Institute. Let's look at women and African Americans. Women entered the military as wax and waves but also as WASPs. WASPs, Women's Air Force Service Pilots, were never actually militarized. WASP formed from two previous services, the Women's Auxiliary Fairing Squadron and Women's Flying Training Detachment in 1943. The women flew testing, training, ferrying, and towing missions in all kinds of aircraft. For example, they were the shakedown 
crews for the first B-29 Super Fortresses that were known for engine fires. The total number of WASP pilots, not in Alabama but throughout, was 1,102. And here's why I mentioned the WASPs. One of the first ferrying women pilots who later became a WASP was Alabamian Nancy Bateson Cruz, who was inducted into the Alabama Women's Hall of Fame in 2005 and who I had the pleasure of seeing speak in Birmingham in the 1990s. More importantly, women entered the industrial workforce in such numbers that by 1943, almost 25% of that industrial workforce in the state was women. As many as 8,000 worked at Mobile's Brookley Field repairing aircraft, half of Brookley Field's workers were women, and at the various Mobile shipyards. Women entered other traditional, or excuse me, non-traditional jobs, and there was a decided class aspect to women's work. Whereas working class women, both white and black, often worked outside the home, middle class women often did not. That was a signifier of middle class status that wives did not work outside the home. That famous We Can Do It campaign, the Rosie de Riveter lore, was aimed at these middle class women when labor shortages were at their peak. Brookley Field specifically recruited women and did so successfully. But this was a wartime expedient. At the end of the war, wartime contracts were pulled quickly and war industries closed. Men returned from abroad and over time society retrenched so that women were less welcome in the workforce. Because Alabama was racially segregated, we now have to, to talk about African-American experiences as one of outsiders, of second-class citizens. The same employment dynamics applied to African-American men and women as applied to white women. They were replacements for white men in the expanding industrial workforce. Traditionally, black men did the unskilled, hot, and dirty work in all industries, but this pertained in the early years of World War II also. But unskilled industrial employment paid better than farm work, while cities offered more freedom. So as I noted earlier, almost 25% of rural African Americans migrated to cities or they migrated out of state, even to take low-end industrial jobs. ADSCO in Mobile is both an example and in another way an outlier. Early in the run-up in the first year of the war, ADSCO employed blacks to do menial work in segregated units but soon the need for trained workers and the Federal Fair Employment Practices Act led ADSCO to begin training that led to skilled jobs building ships for African Americans. Then in May 1943, ADSCO elevated 12 of these black workers, of the 7,000 black workers employed there, to welders, skilled work. That was on a day shift. That night, the whites on the night shift rioted, and they ran all of the black employees off of Pinto Island. Soldiers at Brookley Field and National Guard units restored order, but it was only in June that the last of the black workers could return to work. So let me summarize. We covered an overview military, industrial, and civilian mobilizations, and examined in a small way how World War II affected Alabama society. The war shaped Alabama and expanded it and its people's opportunities for the remainder of the 20th century. It did this through military mobilization. 300,000 Alabamians served in uniform, and the original signature unit of the state was the 31st Dixie Division of Infantry into which the Alabama National Guard enlisted in 1940. Alabama also benefited from extraordinary expansion of Army and Army Air Corps bases and training facilities throughout all areas of the state. Industry geared up wildly to produce war materiel. 60% of defense spending in the state went to munitions manufacturing, especially to ordnance plants in North Alabama. 
Birmingham and Huntsville, but also Gadsden, Anniston, Talladega, and Childersburg produced munitions and other ordnance and employed thousands. Other defense spending went to depots scattered across the state and to bomber repair and modification statements, especially Birmingham Airfield and Mobile's Berkeley Field. Also, shipbuilding expanded on Mobile's Pinto Island and just upriver at Chickasaw. Civilians mobilized as they did in World War I, but with greater coordination. Formal organizations were more centralized from the Alabama State Defense Council to the USO, Red Cross, and Civil Air Patrol. Informally, Alabamians pulled together to provide ad hoc services as well as to collect scrap, buy war bonds, and suffer through rationing. Alabama governor, government, too, was better coordinated than during World War I. Governor Dixon streamlined many state operations, created teachers' retirement system, and he created the state hiring merit system. And Governor Sparks wisely spent the state treasury surplus on expanding education and easing the burdens of war. During Sparks' administration, Alabama passed a constitutional amendment making the legislature meet every two rather than every four years, so the legislature did not miss World War II like it had missed World War I. Finally, we examined a little bit how war affected Alabama society. Shortages abounded and extreme dislocation in search of opportunities affected almost everyone. Alabama sharecroppers fled farms for factories in cities, which led to an irreversible decrease in tenancy and an irreversible increase in mechanization. In the cities, infrastructure suffered from poor and non-existent housing to pay unpaved roads, to poor schools, and even to decreased medical treatment. Higher education too was whipsawed. All schools saw their enrollments plummet, but Auburn and Alabama instituted war-related training short courses and trained so-called 90-day wonders for the military itself. After the GI Bill passed in 1944, college enrollments went the other direction. They skyrocketed so high that no campus could expand enough to accommodate the demand for professors, classes, space, or housing. Two groups who did not enjoy social privilege or first-class citizenship, women and African Americans, saw their horizons expand in World War II. Later shortages opened opportunities for women, especially white middle-class women, to work in industry and earn industrial wages. Blacks, too, moved into industry, and shortages forced some employers to train and promote at least a few skilled jobs. Unfortunately, like during and after World War I, however, white workers, at least at ADSCO, rebelled against any improvement in African-American conditions. They were unsuccessful, but they did rebel. And with that, I'll end the lecture. As always, thanks for your attention.